Thank you, Swid. I'm going to read an excerpt from a little book called Peace Prayers. Mm. And this is by Rabbi Harold Kushner. A prominent Jewish prayer concludes, may he who made peace in the heavens grant peace to us on earth. What does it mean to create peace in the heavens? Ancient man looked up into the sky and he saw the sun and the rain clouds and he would say to himself, how can fire and water, sun and rain coexist in the same sky? Either the water would put out the fire or the fire would dry up the water. How do they get along? It must be a miracle. The sun says, if I dry up the rain clouds as I possibly could, the world will not survive without rain. The clouds say, if we extinguish the sun, the world will perish in darkness. So the fire and water make peace, realizing that if either one of them achieved a total victory, the world could not endure. And I was thinking how this ties into chapter 16 that we have for today. When we pray to God to grant us the sort of peace he ordained in the heavens, this is the miracle we ask for. How can men and women live together happily? They are opposites. Their needs are different. Their rhythms are different. It takes a miracle for them to bridge those differences and unite the masculine side of God's image with the feminine side. How can Arabs and Israelis learn to live together? Irish Catholics and Irish Protestants, Black South Africans and White South Africans. It takes a miracle for them to realize if they won, if they had it all and the other side had nothing, the world could not survive their victory. Only by making room for everyone in the world, even for our enemies, can the world survive. May God, who showed us the miracle of shalom, making room for each other and giving, us, giving up the illusion of victory in the heavens, grant a similar, similar miracle to all of us who inhabit the earth. And a short prayer. Lord, hear our prayers. And we pray especially for the situation in Ukraine and Eastern Europe and all the other countries affected. May we make room for everyone so that the world can survive. In Christ's name, amen. 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 All right. Um, thank you, Swid. That was wonderful. That was great. <clears throat> yeah, I like that. I may steal that. <laughs> so, um, actually, is that in a book you have, or did you find that online? Okay. No, it's a book that we've had. It's uh, Peace Prayers. It's uh, Harper Press. We've had it for a long, long time. Okay. In fact, it was given to us by Judy Perryman. Ah. And I guess a committee committee that Tom had served on. I guess it was it was a peace committee at the church several years ago. Cool. I see Jenny Turner's name in here. Oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah. And I think Louise Westfall. Yes. So that was a day or two ago. <laughs> <laughs> and actually i i was reading this a couple of weeks ago and i had had tagged it down uh to share at some point well, and they're you know they're they're re uh pieces by by barbara ironrick and, and uh, tolstoy um plato Teresa of avila the dalai lama etc cool <laughs> okay um questions <clears throat> swid <laughs> <laughs> well um i know you had a reference to verses 13 through i believe 16 in your notes but um i i you know i i'm sure we will discuss that section more carefully right but it's one of the, you know, the foul spirits like frogs come up from the mouth right. of the dragon. And then also in verse 19, it talks about the great city split into three parts. And I'm just not sure what city 
That is, I know following is a reference to Babylon, but I don't know that it is that. Okay. So. Yeah, we'll make sure to talk about the great city. Okay. What else? In here. Yeah. Yes, Mike. You're muted. Uh, in my uh, in my book, uh, verse uh, verse fifteen is printed in red ink. <laughs> And normally when uh, I see red ink printed in my book, it it's, uh, tells me that it's Jesus that's, that's talking. Right. I'm trying to figure out uh, how did Jesus get involved in this particular chapter in this particular verse? Did it just come out of nowhere? Yes. No. <laughs> 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 okay. Yes. It's, uh, I'll just quickly say 15 is a warning. You know, it's 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 a warning to the people to be faithful. Okay, but we'll we'll talk about that as well because that references back to an earlier part of Revelation. Anything else? Okay, Swid. It was really amazing to me that with all of these plagues, you know, the, the six plagues that. The people remain stiff-necked and not repenting. And of course, the I think the ultimate statement some, at some point comes in here that they deserve whatever punishment was bestowed upon them. Yeah. Yes. We'll talk about that whole issue of being stiff-necked. I, I like that. <laughs> That's a great image. Can't turn your head to see what's really there. Barbara. Okay, so that verse that we said uh, that was in read that Mike said in the Bible, mine says that it refers back to Matthew um, 24 or 42 or wherever it says, you know, uh, keep awake. You don't know when the Lord is coming uh, like a thief in the night. So that's right. probably why it's in red was... It was quoting Jesus, even if he wasn't part of the story. Exactly. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Literally. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It is an interesting interjection there. Yeah. In my Bible, it's in quote, um, yeah, not quotations, parentheses. parentheses. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's a commercial break for Jesus that, that he's, <laughs> you know, he's warning people. It's interesting that they take it back to Matthew because you can take it back to Mark too. To Mark, but also you can you can take it back to the church at Laodicea. Hmm. And which we'll talk about when we get there. But yeah, but that that's that just shows how there's nothing new in Revelation. That that it all continues the same concepts and themes. Um, from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. What else? Anything else before we jump into it? Well, I, I would just say that in my Bible, most of the letters to the churches are in also in red. Hmm. Yes. Yeah, that's 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 interesting that they would all be in in. Uh, in red. Um, Basically saying that Christ is telling John what to do. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> Excuse me. What else? What about the uh, when you get to it is finished? <laughs> oh, yes. Right. 
Ja. Ja, it, um, yeah it, as Barbara said, we get to celebrate the victory. Um, <laughs> we get to celebrate the victory before the victory's complete, interestingly enough. Mm. Um, but again, that's the issue with Revelation, is it's not linear. <clears throat> Okay, it's a it's a it's a series of images and pictures, um, if you will, that show us the future, and it's not necessarily straight through. Because after this, once we come back after after I'm back, um, we'll be talking about Babylon again. We'll be talking about the the fall of Babylon. You know, in other words, it just keeps giving us different images of the same thing. Um, but this will be sort of the declaration of victory. Dave. And after several of the plagues, it asks, you know, it says, and the people still did not repent. It's as if uh, there is still is a, 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 an opportunity to repent all the way up to the end of these plagues. Is that correct? Uh, right reading? Yeah, yeah, and, and let's talk about that, but we'll talk about that whole idea of repentant, stiff-necked. Um, it, all, it all plays in together, and, and I think it speaks to choices, human nature, all of it. it it's, in some ways, it can be seen very simplistically, but in other ways, I think it's, it's, a, it's a much deeper idea about how human beings orient their lives. Okay, what else? All right, let's jump into 16. Um, <clears throat> how does it begin? You know? In the temple of the witnesses in heaven, he is in heaven, does it not? Right. It begins in the in the temple in hell, loud voice from the temple, the temple being in heaven, right? Saying what? Kind of permission to go do your thing. <laughs> go out and um, put go go pour out the seven bowls of God's fury upon the earth. Right now. Why? Why is God pouring out God's fury or wrath upon the earth? Why is that a legitimate thing for God to do? Well, there's so many that have the mark of the beast to refuse to repent. I, I could also, you know, it, with each bowl, it, in a sense, it's, it's a warning and, and, wanting to people to take the chance to repent, but they don't do it. So the destruction continues until mm -hmm. it's over. Right, Brian. Could this be related back to the, you know, this is not the first time God's done this. A reminder of the people that, you know, in Noah's days, the flood, he poured out his wrath on the earth also to mm -hmm. cleanse it and purge it of all evil. But I guess we know it, didn't work. We had to do a few more purges, but uh, would that just be in a line of the the final purge, maybe? Um, it's drawing up to it, but unlike Noah, where no one had a chance to repent, um, you know, it this, the, the, yeah. So this is focused on two things, as as several of you have have mentioned. Well, actually, let yeah, just real quickly, if you jump down to verse. And I heard the angel of the waters say, what? That God is just. Right. Mm -hmm. That, so. Well, and it goes on. We, this judgment is because of the slaying of the saints and the prophets by these unfaithful. Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> in that statement, you have given them blood to drink. Mm -hmm. It is what they deserve. Right. And, and so the, there are two pieces to the, to the plagues, because these are really plagues, right? They mirror the plagues in Exodus. And so if we're moving to a new beginning, okay, right? So, so we're moving, the whole thing of Revelation is we're moving to a, a new creation, a new beginning. And part of a new beginning is freeing the people of God. And the second part is justice. God is a God of grace and God is a God of justice. These two things, as we've said before, are held in tension. And so what you have then is the wrath of God is poured out because, as you said, Swid, innocent blood has been shed. <laughs> that the forces of evil, if you will, have shed the blood of the saints and the prophets who are innocent of wrongdoing. It's it's violence for the sake of violence. It's, I mean, the, the shedding of their blood is violence for the sake of violence, for domination. Um, it's a violation of Torah, and it's a violation of what Christ preaches. So, the wrath is not simply because God is this big, angry, mad God. It's focused on justice. Okay, and, and so seven, again, is the complete amount, right? So we're going to get seven bowls. Um, and so, but to whom does this, who does this really affect? Looking at verse two. Those that have the mark of the beast. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, it's, it's focused not just on all humanity, but then that changes. Um, and what do you make of verses three and four? Yes, Dexter. Well, four. I was struck by four. At, uh, okay, I'll say it. It's, in a sense, because this is maybe what I like to read about and know. It's like the unraveling of creation, you know, because mm -hmm. each of those touchstones, like the sun and the, the sea dying and all, that's building those up was what led to us. So in a sense, this is unraveling them. You know, I, I three is not quite that way. Did you say three? Yeah, three and four. One about the blood. Yeah. It was different, but the rest of it struck me as very contemporary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the wonderful thing about Revelation. It's not just ancient. It's very contemporary. Swid. Yeah. A couple of things. Um, one, I can see why people in reading some of this today look at events that are occurring in, in nature and politically, et cetera, you know, look to it as the end, end, end times as well. But I was also thinking in reading those, reading all of these about the, dis, the destruction of God's creation. And I thought, well, in destroying it, God is preparing for a new creation. Yes. A, a recreation, if you will. Yes, a recreation is what's being pre prepped for here. Barbara. Why would God have to destroy God's own creation? I can understand him, uh, God destroying the creation of the beast, but I don't get why God would destroy God's creation. Because it's because it's evil. It's not all evil. We still got the people there that are working for it, and we don't know that the sun is corrupted or the rivers or the sea or the earth, because they rise up at the end. So that they're good. I mean, they they're the ones that come to the rescue. So 
I, I think what we're, what's happening here is it's mirroring, mirroring, I think, the plagues of Moses in Egypt. Well, that I can buy. I just can't buy that God is trying to destroy God's own creation no. after God said it was good. Right, right. No, this is, this is a particular plague for a particular moment. Uh, yeah. Dave and then Bobby. Yeah, what, what hits me is that if you study archaeology and all that, uh, new civilizations are quite often built on the foundation <laughs> of old civilizations. Yeah. And in order to do that, you have to kind of clear off <laughs> and to allow you, but you keep the foundation and you build up again. So to me, there's a kind of a, an analogy to God he's created it and then mankind on um, building on top of it has messed up and and now i got to go back to the foundations which are consistent from the beginning of the story okay neat way to look at it bobby that was kind of the first question that you asked um it it's like when God is, he, he's making people suffer with the sores, and then one by one, he's taking away their source of food. Um, also, everything that man needs really to exist. And we really don't need all that because in the end, um, we're not going to need the earth. We're, we're going to be with God in a place called heaven. And, and so the earth is no longer necessary. So one by one, it could be destroyed. Except, Bobby, where we're headed in Revelation is not everybody ends up in heaven. Everybody ends up on earth at the end of Revelation. That okay. God is restoring heaven and earth. So just hang in there. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do that. <laughs> Hang in there and we'll we'll get there, which because a lot of people find that very surprising. Amy Rogers. You're muted. I just looked this up for some reference here. And um this writer had mentioned that the the blood um in the sea is um has in mind a body that's been dead for some time. Right. Whatever happens to the water, it becomes like the rotting fluids found in a decomposing body. As a result, everything in the sea dies. So he's again building up to his judgment and expanding it out to. Um, so I don't know. That's interesting way of thinking of it. Yeah, and, and I think that goes back to Bobby's comment that what's being stripped away are ways of making a living, of feeding people. Um, you know, that you, you can no longer fish in the sea, you can no longer uh, do that. So, yes, so it is, that, and that is the image. The of all life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It became like the blood of a corpse. <laughs> Ooh. Um. Yeah, and so you get this ever-increasing um, sort of levels of, of wrath. And then we jump into, as we talked about earlier, five, six, and seven. Um, where we're given the explanation for these plagues. That one, their, their wrath of God because these people have shed innocent blood, so now they have to live with blood. Mm. You know, it's like what goes around comes around. So they've shed this blood, and now they have to live with this blood in the, in the rivers and in the oceans. Um, and also, part of what this demonstrates is that God is the God of all of these things. That God is doing things that the unholy trinity can't do. Um, and so God has, has the power and the justice. And a voice from the altar, yes, O Lord God, the Almighty, this is verse 7. Your judgments are true and just. 
Okay. Um, all right. So now let's look at eight, nine. Let's talk about the stiff necked, unrepenting nature. <coughs> How do you all wrap your heads around that? Because that's, that is, that is key to the next several bowls. What do you all do with that? I think in all of them, it refers to how they cursed God. And that stood out for mm -hmm. me. And I, I asked, you know, why do they curse God? Well, they're cursing God for the punishments on that. But I, I also infer that they have no belief in God. They have just dismissed God in their lives. Well, in some ways, depends on what you mean by dismissed God. Or perhaps never even sought to know God in their lives. Right, but they, they know God is there, right? Because they're mm -hmm. acknowledging that God, Yahweh, is the source of the plagues. And they're so, cursing him. Right, yeah. so they're cursing him. <laughs> So they have to believe in him to, to at least acknowledge him to some degree. To, to right. And so, yeah. yes, yes. Sorry, Val. That's okay. No, no. Because I think sometimes we struggle with this idea of believing God. What does it mean? You know, I believe in God. Well, what does that mean? You know, what, what does that mean to say, I believe in God? Do I believe God exists? And actually, there's this wonderful thing that's a, it's like a six or eight step process because people will did questionnaires about do you believe in God or not believe in God and 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 that's a really sort of absurd thing because you know do you believe that there's a God who is the God of the universe that you should follow on the one end of the spectrum or on the other end do you believe there's nothing beyond the physical universe right so those are those are the opposite ends but along the way there are all sorts of gradients mm -hmm. about what one might believe about God, is there a higher power? Is there a higher power who cares about us? Is there, a, you know, anyway. And, and so I think sometimes we need to think about sort of <laughs> what we mean by belief. So at least here, they believe that Yahweh exists, right? And that Yahweh is responsible for these things. But they won't change and they won't repent. Mm -hmm. Right. So the question is, why not? <laughs> Dexter. Yeah, well, just an odd uh, impression. And it might be that w people think of themselves perhaps as a God themselves. It's like, how dare you? This, the promise is to ascend to the throne room and um, be part of the heavenly experience, but uh, which we could mean total change. We really don't have any idea what's up there or, or around us, I should say, not up there. That's medieval. Well, that's all right. But, but if, you're, if you're holding on to this, yeah, yeah. If you're holding on to the here and now, you sort of imagine, well, it, it ought to be exactly like I am right now. And I kind of rather like the way I am right now. So why, why, why would I change? I can't imagine changing from exactly the way the world is right now. So how dare you, you know? Right, right. Amy, and then Kathy. Well, it's not human nature. I mean, look at the instances. How often do we just automatically just say, I'm sorry, but do we really mean it? I mean, especially in severe circumstances and situations, it's like they have to be pressured first to say, I'm sorry. Um, so... I don't know. I just think it's human nature. You know, something bad happens and we try to find a source of who to blame for it. Mm -hmm. um, and um, 
instead of looking inward a lot of times and how we can change it's just human nature to maybe it's survival i don't know that we just constantly <laughs> yeah yeah it's it's human nature and we'll talk more about that kathy yeah, I was pretty much going to say what Amy said. It seemed to me they were just being human because how many times in our own lives when things aren't going the way we expect that they should or we want them to or they're much more difficult that the first person you get angry with is God, right? Like, why are you doing this to me? And why is it me that you're picking on? And, you know, kind of go look somewhere else. I'm just doing the best I can kind of thing. So I would think it's human nature too. Right, yes, human nature to blame. Absolutely. And the blame God. I'm going to go to Brian, then Swid. I'm sorry, yeah. Kathy, go ahead. I was going to say it's human nature, not only to blame, but also to, to not try to change. Hmm. You know, it's easy to change when times are good, right? It's much more difficult to change when times are hard. And that's when you should change. But we just don't think that that's how it should work because we're too angry, right? So it's harder to do that when you're mad. Right. You put up, you put up walls in resistance to change. Brian, then Swid. Yeah, I was thinking um, a lot of times in life, you know, when we think we're right, and these people probably thought we're right, hey, we're successful, things are going here. So we have trouble admitting where we're wrong. And I think we can see that. I mean, I just look and I was thinking the example here, and I know it's maybe a bad example to make, but let's say Putin in the Ukraine, the people think that their freedom is more important than dominance. I don't, you know, uh, and I'm saying it is, but I'm just saying they would have to, then it's all the same thing, all this hell and brimstone's coming down upon them. And, uh, uh, you know, for them to say, well, we're going to repent and ask forgiveness from Putin would be a hard step to make. Although Putin thinks he's right. And, you know, so I think that is, again, human nature. When we think we're right, it's hard to see clearly that we're wrong. Yes. And I'm going to push that further in just a minute. Swid. Uh, as we were talking about this, I was reminded, well, yesterday, your sermon also reminded me of a conversation I had with my our 90-year-old cousin in Kansas who <sighs> talk about a female version of Job. Her husband has dementia. She lost a son to cancer two years ago, another son is dealing with severe physical problems. She has a daughter-in-law who was dying of cancer, plus a sister this year, uh, her cousin, my husband, Tom. Wow. And <laughs> Cynthia, she's been a model of strength to me. And she said, with all this going on, she says, I have determined that every night before I go to bed, I'm going to write down five things for which I'm thankful. And your oh, meditation yeah. with us yesterday yeah. brought that home again um uh, to me um and you know we're talking about how difficult you know how difficult it is to change our thinking and positions that we have towards difficulties and in revelation here these people are just looking at you know at the moment and and not not thinking of other things evidently yeah, Mary Golds. Thank you, Swid. Mary, you're muted. It's over here. Um, I'm sitting here and wondering about how easy it is to go with the flow. Um, you know, somebody cries out loud that green is turning to purple. I don't know, something inane. And, and by their own charisma, everybody starts believing that. And once you get caught up in something like that, you don't want to admit you've begun to believe in the wrong side. You know, you're swept up in this whatever, it's sort of perception reality. It's, it's sort of a, you are being misled on purpose into something else. And once that happens, 
I think it become it's very hard to give up. It's 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 just there, and you just you know you keep wondering that of all these persons who have been labeled six six six, how many were really sincerely of that um, belief, and how many were just going with the flow? It was easier than believing the other way. Right. So, Dave, I thought I saw Dave's hand there. David, did you have something? It wasn't, but the one I, I will mention, my footnote refers back to 1113 of Revelations, where there, there was the earthquake, and then the people glorified God because of his awesome power. Yeah. So it's kind of interesting that in spite of all this, that there is this realization of the awesome power of, of, of whoever caused this. These people yeah. are so set in their way, they, they, they're even blind to, blind to that. Right. And so picking up on sort of all, all of this in a way, one of the fund, uh, sort of fundamental parts of human nature, and, and I'm speaking sort of metaphorically here, when we give our hearts to someone or something, it becomes virtually impossible for us to believe something different from that to which we've given our hearts. You can talk about it, again, met metaphorically speaking. Um, I'll, I'll use several is, uh, illustrations. Uh, I'll just use Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses have predicted the, the second coming of Christ at least a half dozen times publicly as, as an entire denomination, their leadership. And obviously Jesus never came. But what ha you would think then that people would, would say to themselves, well, you know, we just can't do this. Maybe they got it wrong. No, no. In fact, it made people believe more firmly in being a Jehovah's Witness and more firmly convinced you could predict the coming of Jesus. Um, you know, that there, there is this phenomenon. Uh, people have used, um, there was a, a group of folks, I don't know, in the 70s, lots of weird things happened in the 70s, um, who were part of one of these cults that believed that a UFO was going to come down and beam them all up. They sold all of their property, um, gave all their money to the leader of the cult. They went to a mountain, I think, in New Mexico, and they were there, and the time passed. None of them left the cult. They died. Well, no, this that was, that was a guy <laughs> named Apple, interestingly okay. enough, who, um, yeah, and they killed themselves. But but these people just said, oh, no, you know, maybe we got something wrong. We still know that we're going to get beamed up. And, and none of them, none of them had their minds changed. And, you know, Jim Jones here, drink this Kool-Aid, you'll die, your children will die. You know, the, there's just this thing about human beings. Once we get locked and loaded, <laughs> Um, it just becomes impossible to change one's mind. And, and in fact, the more you push someone to change their mind, you all may have experienced this in your own lives. Um, Bowen calls it pursuing distancing. The more we pursue someone to change their minds, the more they distance from us and put up walls. Right, So in a sense, the more God pursues these people with plagues, the more resistant they're going to become. You know, it, it takes a tremendous amount. Th think about the, the end of World War II. Young boys and men were still allowing themselves to be conscripted into the German army. 
to defend Berlin, even though it was, it, it was obvious to anyone and everyone that the end had come. And yet they just couldn't, they couldn't wrap their heads around it. Val. I was just thinking, um, using again Jim Jones as an example, that there also seems to be in some people's makeup or whatever, the um, impulse to fixate on and follow a person to the to such an extent that they don't exhibit any reason anymore. I mean, they they believe so completely what that person is telling them that they've lost their ability to think things through, uh, believe any other sources, you know, and that plays into this somehow, I think. And mm -hmm. it's, it's something I kind of have a hard time understanding, but we see all kinds of evidence of it in the kinds of situations you described. Um, and I think, I'm thinking something like that could be part of what's going on with the people in Revelations as well, that they, they're just so fixated on either an idea or a person that they can't see anything else, you know, and they can't use their own reasoning. Right. And that's the, the, the unholy trinity that we've read that essentially they've given their heart, mind, and soul to the unholy trinity, to the anti-God. And, and as you're right, that, that there's nothing, you know, even the plagues. <laughs> but now there, there's a second part to this. What would, the, what would this all, all of these plagues and a lack of repentance, what would it help explain to the first century church? What would it help make sense of in their world? John. Well, they were being persecuted by the Romans when this was written. And so they would understand that they needed to have strength through persecution and that there was a reward for that. And this would point that out and that the persecution could be substantially greater than what they were facing. But if they were strong in their beliefs, they would still be saved. Right. And, and an extension of that is that this would explain why the Romans didn't believe what they believed. It would explain why the Romans didn't believe in Jesus and show love and compassion and, and care, but still, as you say, kept persecuting the saints instead. You know, because that's part of the, the question for the early church is, wait a minute, Jesus has come. Jesus is the savior of the world. Jesus preaches love and unity and compassion. And here, you know, it ain't happening. <laughs> you know, we're still, we're still under persecution. So, yeah, so absolutely. And, and this would help explain why no matter what happens, that, that some people, and also not just from family members, my guess is, Many early Christians were, were excommunicated by their families. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, why don't my family members believe? Well, because they've given their heart to the, to the beast. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and, and so there's great comfort, if you will, in that. Um, now. So they, we talked about um, didn't repent, curse the name. All right. So now, verse 10. What do you see in 10? John. Well, in the beginning, darkness covered the earth. Right. So we're going back once again. We're seeing these parallels uh, with the Old Testament, with creation, with the release of the people. You know, there's no new stories. Right. Right. 
That's right. So we're returning, we're returning to a primordial state. Yes, Swid. Well, and that it is striking at the throne of the beast and, and that kingdom. Yeah. Yes, it's striking at the throne of the beast. It's taking it to the heart of the enemy. And just one last thought, thinking about this and what we've just been talking about. Um, again, returning to the Second World War. You know, it, it was obvious to the Japanese that they couldn't hold out the bombing of all their major cities. And yet they refused to surrender. And, and it took two atomic bombs to get them to surrender. You know, and so it's it's amazing how even when you strike at the heart of it, of of those who are opposed to God's gracious reign, that that it just the resistance is tremendous. Um, so now we jump into 12 and move forward. What is, what does 12 begin to, what, what do you take with verse 12? What, what's sort of the imagery of that? Swid. The mention of the word Euphrates takes me back to, you know, the Tigris Euphrates areas believe, you know, the site of Eden. Mm. Going back to the very, very beginning. Yeah, but in this case, the East represents something else. It represents evil coming of armies, uh, gathering of, of the kings of these various nations to strike against um, yeah. the faithful. Right. It's, it's God is allowed. Go ahead, Barbara. I think saw your well, hand. Didn't we, though, have the three wise men come from the East <laughs> to proclaim? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm conflicted on this. Right. <laughs> Right, but if you look at um, the waters are dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. So right, so you had the kings originally who came and were wise. But now what we've had is a transformation of the world. So those coming from the east are not wise kings, but evil kings. Mm -hmm. that, that if you think about what evil does, evil takes what's good and transforms it and seduces it. And so if you think about those two images, somehow the wisdom of the East has now been seduced into being the evil of the East. That that's how powerful evil is in the world. But it doesn't say that anywhere. No, but that's the assumption one needs, to, at least for me. <laughs> You're getting John <laughs> Judson's view that that it, that it is this power of, because if you go further, three foul spirits like frogs coming from the mouth of the dragon, from the mouth of the beast, from the mouth of the false prophet, demonic spirits performing signs who go abroad to the kings of the whole world, you know, that, that you have this power of evil to the whole world, including the East, where once upon a time there was wisdom. Anyway, you're, you're getting my take, my, my take on, on this. Swid and then David. Well, in your notes, uh, you refer to the kings of the East as coming from the previous oppression, oppressing yeah. empires of Assyria, Babylon, and Persia. Yeah, that, that, that. even though Rome is mm -hmm. from the West, all of these other empires have come, well, Greece came from the West as well, but came from the East. Um, and, and again, it's, it's, it's metaphor, it's imagery. Uh, Dave. 
I was basically going to say the same thing as Swift. Okay. And so what's being prepared for here is the final battle. Right? This, this is it. This is the final contest. <clears throat> Although it's... I say that, but we'll find as we go through the rest of Revelation, it's not the final battle. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the first final battle. Um, it, it, anyway, and again, this is why it's, it, it's not totally linear. Um, but anyway, all I can think about is Lord of the Rings and this this is for those of you who are familiar with this is the battle of helms deep you know it's it's the next to last to final battle um so val <laughs> <laughs> it's funny you say lord of the rings because what was going through my head was harry potter the final yeah. battle at the end between Voldemort and, and harry and his crew and then it was it was the, the final battle between good and evil <laughs> right yeah, although the final, final battle in Harry Potter is not at the castle. It's out. Right. Yeah. Someplace else. Yeah. Where yeah. Harry Potter becomes the Christ figure. Yes. Interestingly yeah. enough. Yeah. Brian. Is there any connection here? <clears throat> when he drives up the Euphrates, kind of reminds me of, a, you know, splitting the Red Sea, where he's, he, in one part he saves the people of Israel, but also it's a trap to let the enemy come in easily and then I like that. I hadn't thought about that. Mm -hmm. But here they're not going to be swallowed up in the river, but after the river. But yeah, I like that. I, I like that. That's a great image. That's a great thought. And so what do you make about the the, the foul spirits? <laughs> Sorry, I have to say, all I have to speak of is, is uh, sorry, what's Lavrov speaking for Putin? You know, we're not bombing any, you know, we're not bombing civilians. Mm -hmm. We're not doing that. You know, we're going to let people go free. They just have to go free by coming to Russia. <laughs> we'll protect them when they come to Russia so we can arrest them and put them in prison camps. You know, I mean, it is this, it, you know, it's always the way of evil is, is we're going to go out and, and seduce. Um, now, which, which then brings us to 15, right? Why is 15 necessary at that point? Or, or why is it important at that point in the story? It tells us that we should not be ready. I'm sorry, say that again, Liz. Say it, it tells us to be ready all the time because we don't know when the seduction by the evil and all that will come along. Yes. Brian. It could also be in the time of, it looks like there's, you know, there's no... <clears throat> end in sight that don't lose faith because even in this time when it looks like all is lost that uh that you know the coming can come at any time right so i think it's working yes on on both of those sort of levels or both of those ideas the one idea is the evil spirits are out recruiting for the army through seduction, they are inviting people to come and be part of this army that is going to overwhelm God's people. So you need to be ready and be alert and not get seduced. The second way, so that's sort of Liz's way, and Brian, yours is, 
yes, even though it appears that all of these forces are being arrayed against us, you need to be faithful. So I think it's working on both of both of these levels um, in there. But it's necessary at this point to keep people faithful either way. Faithful not to join the army and faithful not to give in and simply surrender. Again, right. you know, think about yeah. Putin. John, think about Putin. Yeah. What he's saying to, oh, just give in, put down your arms. You know, it'll all be good. I'm really your liberator. You know, so it's 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 Swid, Swid, and then John. You're you're muted, Swid. I'm thinking, too, of the young Russian, the young men that have been, uh, well, conscripted into the army and having, you know, they're unprepared and they, you know, talk about being led like lambs led to the slaughter. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. That's a great image for this. John. Well, it took me back to the sign on the gate over Auschwitz that said, work will set you free. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. It's, mm -hmm. It is this, this ongoing battle mm -hmm. between the forces of deception mm -hmm. that lead to death or the forces of God that lead to life. Mm -hmm. and, and ultimately, that's the, that's the fundamental choice in life um and and to and as human beings we are easily deceived yeah. i mean we just we're easily deceived um okay so where does all of this lead us to verse 16 So, what happens in verse 16? They're led to Armageddon. Yep. Swit, if you're talking to us, you're muted. If you're talking to the phone, you're, you're okay. <laughs> yes, it leads us to Armageddon. And so... Um, let me... Mm. So, yes. So what have you all heard about Armageddon? Supposed to be the battle of all battles. Right, yeah. the battle of all battles. Yep. And uh, Armageddon is, is a is simply a location where multiple important battles in the history of the people of Israel took place. Although it's interesting, it is, um, yeah, uh, Armageddon, Armageddon is a, uh, is a plane. It is where the people of God have been defeated, where they've been victorious. It, it's just a place of battle. And it's just simply this image of a place of conflict. Now, in the late great planet Earth, um, Hal Lindsey's book from the 70s, this was going to be where Russia, the United States, and China were all going to meet with millions of troops, and, and, and that battle would then <clears throat> lead to the second coming of Christ. Which, by the way, <laughs> you think folks are doing with the, uh, what's going on right now with this? Yeah. 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 All the all the apocalyptic, prophetic, <laughs> charismatic Christians out there. Are, well, here it is. We're almost there. Okay. I can understand that. You know. Yeah. I mean, 
there are echoes in all throughout this of what's going on right now. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, it, it, so yeah. Yeah, and um, gosh, I'm trying to think of his name. Um, 700 Club. Oh, oh. yes. Yeah. I can uh, picture um, him. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I can't believe I, I can picture him. Anyway. Really? Yeah. He he said a cup to a week and a half a week ago. Is that Fallwell, John? No, not Fallwell. No. Yeah. Pat Robertson. Pat Robertson. Yeah. Pat yeah. Robertson. Thank you, Swift. Pat Robertson said God was making Putin do this <laughs> because this was Armageddon. <laughs> this was the beginning of Armageddon. And so Putin had no choice. Because yeah. God was forcing his hand. Mm -hmm. You know, somehow I'm not sure that's my reading of Revelation, that, mm -hmm. that God is making Putin slaughter thousands of innocent people. Come on, come on in. But anyway, um, but it's simply that, that ultimately <clears throat> there's a final conflict. Now, What's the response from heaven? Swid. And I'm are you looking at verse 17? Yeah, starting with 17. Well, uh, number one, the seventh angel, again, the number seven of perfection, yeah. but uh, pouring that bowl and the voice comes from the temple. And I'm thinking, I'm reading that and it is, it references back to Good Friday, Christ on the cross saying yeah. it is finished and the earthquake, right. et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and this is typical language of a theophany, an appearing mm -hmm. of God. Think about when Moses goes up to Mount Sinai, you know, thunder, lightning, you know, this is what happens when God appears and God mm -hmm engages with human beings um now this leads us to a question someone asked about verse 19 the great city uh, any thoughts about what that language implies what biblical image going back to genesis the great city John. Oh. I would think here it could be Jerusalem, Rome, uh, Babel. Um, you know, one of those three anyway, that they would this during this time period they would have thought about. Right. And and I would argue it's all three. Three, three and one. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, what's what's the story of Babel? I mean, what's the whole story of Babel? Man's chutzpah. <laughs> I like that. Yes, man's chutzpah. Oh, that's good, John. I like that. That'll preach. <laughs> um, man's chutzpah, because they believed they could do what? Build a tower to heaven. And? <clears throat> I don't know. That's all I know. Conquer <laughs> heaven. They could displace God. <laughs> Right, that's the great city. The great city is all of these cities, as John said, whether it's Rome or Babylon or Babel, all of these cities thought they could displace God. Mm -hmm. So the great city rolls all of these images into a single, a single vision of the great city, meaning all of those who thought that by human means, We could be greater than God. And so then it's, it's broken into three pieces. And you notice, and the cities of the nations fell, right? And so it says, oh, wait, the great city really is. The great cities of the world of the nations fell. God remembered great Babylon, gave her the wine cup of the fury of his wrath. Again, Babylon being the mm. prototypical image of evil because of what it did to the people of God. Oh. Mm -hmm. 
and every island fled away. No mountains were to be found. Mm -hmm. You know, just it's like this transformative map moment of creation. Everything collapses. Everything is transformed. Mm -hmm. um, and I am grateful because I don't think my car insurance would deal with a hundred pound piece of hail fall <laughs> on my car. Um, but again, this is reminiscent of the plagues of Egypt, because hail was one of the plagues of Egypt. And again, their response after all of this is still to curse God. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I just, it's, it's this, so, ha, so what do you draw then from, from, uh, chapter 16? There are several things I think we can draw. David. Throughout this chapter, particularly because there are three plagues that deal with water, the sea, and then the rivers, and then the Euphrates, and all that. I got caught up in water. And I'm driven back to the woman at the well, mm. who asked for a, a cup of water, and then Christ says, you could have asked for the living water. Right. And it, it seems to me that that's part of the tension throughout here, is the choice for the earthly goods yeah versus the living water yeah i like that that yeah i mean that powerful image of water that works its way through all of the scriptures and all of revelation um you know water can be chaos water can be life it just depends on on which way you choose to live into it yeah what other things sort of do you draw from this Swid. In spite of these plagues, I still see God attempting to reconcile people to him. And throughout, you know, the two-year Bible study and other studies mm -hmm. that we've done, the, the grace of God throughout the history, both the Hebrew and the Christian Testament and, and into, into this chapter of Revelation, you know, it's still trying to get the people to him. Not giving, you know, <clears throat> in, a, in these plagues, it almost seems like he's giving up, but no, he's hoping that the people will, will return to him. Right. And thinking about that real quickly, and Brian, I see you. Uh, uh, after the plagues of Egypt, what did the what did the people of Egypt do? Well, they they gave to the Israelites, surrendered their gold or jewels. That's right. They said, "Have a great life." Mm -hmm. <laughs> they let them go, and they blessed them along the <clears throat> way. You know, in a way, that's the appropriate response to all of this. And so what we're seeing here is instead of what happened in Exodus, we're seeing here Revelation just the opposite. Yes, Brian. Yeah, well, <clears throat> from like a 30,000 foot view here, as I see anger, you know, again, going back to when we, we think we're always right, let's, I mean, let me go back to the Putin analogy here. Yeah. He started to have a quick victory in Ukraine. As military people said, we're going to go in, the people are going to welcome us. Uh, this is great. It doesn't happen. He doesn't realize why it didn't happen, but he gets angry that it didn't happen, and he doubles down. Yeah. And I think that's what we do a lot in our life. And these people here got angry because their lives were upset. They were looking for someone to blame, but then they got angry. And then they, when anger comes in, you can't see clearly. It clouds your focus. And I just think it's a kind of a thing that happens with us. I mean, if we look at this, <laughs> we are no different in a lot of ways than the people sometimes marked with the 666 when we don't get our way in life. You know, 
Yes, anger closes us down, doesn't it? It it just does it absolutely. Anything else? All right then. Uh, we'll close in prayer. Remember, we're off for the next three weeks. You get a break from Revelation. <laughs> get some time to breathe deeply and recoup a little bit, um, and then we'll jump back in uh, to chapter seventeen on the fourth of April. Who'd like to close this in prayer? Anyone? Brian, thank you. Lord, as we study you, as we study your word this morning, may it provide us with lasting insight and courage to go forward doing your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. You. See you guys. Bye. Okay, have a good trip, John. Thank you.